So good day, friends. This is Dr. Bob Hamilton, and you have tuned in today to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you all for being there today. I know that you're busy people. You got kids, you got grandkids, you're running around shopping, all the things that people do. The fact that you tune in to the show means a lot to me. I thank you for that. If you like what you hear, I say it every week, share it with other people, share it with your friends, your family. Uh, We're building an audience, and we are building an audience, by the way. Our numbers are going up, which is encouraging. And uh, the reason they are is because I bring phenomenal people to to you every week on Tuesdays. And today is such a pleasure to welcome to uh, the Hamilton Review, Mark Tapps. And Mark is the Shulman Fellow on Popular Culture at the David Horowitz Freedom Center here in Los Angeles, based in Los Angeles. He's worked in Hollywood as an assistant uh, director. He is a writer. He is a father. He is a very busy guy. We're going to talk about a lot of things. He's also recently uh, just about ready to complete a book. We're going to talk about that book a little bit later on. But Mark Tapson, welcome to the Hamilton Review. Dr. Bob, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. It's really, really a tremendous pleasure to have you, Mark. And I'm really Likewise. looking forward to this conversation. So, Mark, I, as you know, you've listened to my show on uh, other people on the, the podcast. You know that I begin by asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, where you're from, people that made an influence on you. Uh, I'm going to turn the micro, microphone over to you and you can take it from there. Okay. Uh, I'll try to keep that story short and try not to digress too much. Uh, it's a it's a long, weird, strange journey uh, that I've been on. I'm happy in the place where I am now, but it, it I took quite a few detours to get here. Uh, so I feel like I'm getting a really late start on the life that I should have been living to begin with. Um, I mark. I, I think I think we all feel that way a little bit. So no no apologies there. Okay. <laughs> good to well good to hear then. I think I probably took a much longer detour than everybody else did, but. Uh, I uh, am a culture critic, as you mentioned. I'm a writer and a cult- mostly a culture critic. I write about the intersection of politics and culture. Uh, I, I actually don't have much of an interest in politics. I find it, and I've always found it a little bit boring, but the cultural stuff really interests me. And uh, so the political impact on the culture, which is heavy now, interests me. And uh, so that's where I am now. But where I began um, was in Arkansas. I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. I've lived my entire adult life out here in California. Uh, But I'm very glad that I grew up in Arkansas. Uh, I didn't feel that way at the time. In fact, when I was young, I was kind of eager to get out of Arkansas and see the the big world out there. Um, After high school, I didn't go straight to college. I instead uh, took a little time off and drove around the country by myself um, to sort of get a look at what was outside of Arkansas. And uh, I kind of fell in love with California and um, promised myself that I would go back once I got home to Arkansas and and sort of got myself together. And and that's what I did. So I I left um, at the age of 19 or 20 for California, lived in San Francisco for many years before moving down to LA where I am now. Um, In retrospect, I'm glad that I had that upbringing in Arkansas um, before moving to a more, shall we say, cosmopolitan uh, international sort of a milieu of where I am now, because I got to experience both those worlds uh, and did not appreciate the world that I grew up in at the time. It was only in retrospect. So I'm glad that I did that. But I'm also glad that I that I left. I'm supposed to be where I am now. Um, I actually initially came out to California to do music because I was I wanted to be a musician. More specifically, I wanted to be a rock star. Uh, you know, this was back in the days when uh, uh, it, being a rock star was still a somewhat uh, relatively, this was back in the mid 70s uh, and late 70s. Uh, so, uh, you know, being a rock star meant a lot to the culture in those days. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, it was everything for people of my generation. And and that's what I wanted to be. So I, I and I played in a band in Arkansas and I wanted bigger, you know, uh, bigger audience and bigger fame and riches and all that uh, stuff, moved out to California and did end up pursuing music. Um, But I also went to college out in California and became very excited about the intellectual life. It it was the first time I had always been a big reader uh, and loved books, but 
really immersing myself in, um, in an English major in college. And also I was a double major, English major and humanities. Um, and <clears throat> being involved in that double major really inspired me and it, it awakened the, the teacher in me because I'm really a teacher at heart. Uh, and so I briefly entertained this idea that I would uh, enter academia, that I would become a professor. And so I aimed for that for a while until I ultimately decided academia was probably not the kind of life that I wanted. Um, also, I, I wish I could say it was a decision made out of wisdom and discernment at the time, but it was mostly a decision made because I was kind of allowing my life to fall apart. Uh, and I was a, a little bit aimless. Um, I was inspired about academia, but personally, I was I was just not, uh, I did, my life was just not together. Um, and so I gave up on the idea of academia, got a little more involved in the music scene and did that for a while, finally reached a point where things were stagnating in San Francisco for me musically. Um, and my girlfriend at the time wanted to move down to LA. She said, I want to go to LA and get involved in Hollywood. She didn't want to be an actress, astonishingly enough. She actually wanted to be behind the camera and work in that realm. So, And so I began to think, well, maybe I'll go too. Things are stagnating for me here. Maybe I'll go to Los Angeles too. Let's Okay, let's do it. So we moved to LA and uh, my girlfriend at the time very quickly decided she hated Hollywood after all and wanted to go back. But I surprisingly came, I came down and ended up doing no music and instead I got involved in Hollywood uh, almost accidentally. And uh, very quickly I be began working with um, producers and directors doing what they called coverage for them. In other words, I would take screenplays uh, that they didn't have the time to read or look at, and I would take screenplays and read them and review them and write these elaborate um, um, analyses of the screenplays. And so I began writing, which interestingly was something I had wanted to do from the time I was 12 years old. Hmm. But again, as I say, I took this, I, 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 I took this ridiculous detour. Instead of pursuing being a writer, I pursued being a musician instead. But I was kind of finding my way slowly back to writing. By, by the and, way, Mark, uh, what, what did you play? What musical instrument do you play? Uh, mostly guitar. Okay, all right. But uh, I, I've also done an awful lot of percussion work. Like at one point, one of the things that I did was uh, I led a band of Afro-Brazilian drummers and dancers. And <laughs> it was <laughs> that was an amazing experience, uh, especially being a white boy from Arkansas leading an Afro-Brazilian <laughs> drumming and dance. But, I, I'd like uh, to see the, I'd like to see the video of that if you got one, please show it to me. <laughs> I think I do somewhere, you know, an old VHS videotape. I'm yeah. not even sure people have anything to play that on anymore. Yeah. Uh, but um, and that actually kind of brings up an interesting political point. If I were to try to do the same thing today, there is no way that I, as a white Arkansan, would be able to lead or maybe even participate in an Afro-Brazilian. Uh, drum and dance band today because I would be accused of cultural appropriation. I would be I would be <laughs> drummed out if you'll pardon the pun. I would be drummed out of that group so fast, even if they let me in, because today cultural you know this uh, the, this idea of cultural appropriation and wokeness and all of this uh, uh, this kind of division that is really ripping us apart that was not really a thing back in the the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s when I was doing that, I, I wouldn't be able to do that today. That's how no, bad the culture no, has it, it, uh, it really degenerated in that you're, respect. You're absolutely right there. There's so so many changes that have happened. And whether you would make it or not in that world, I guess it would, uh, it was a flip of the coin, I suppose. But uh, yeah. you're right. that Even that, the, I, the issue of even that happening then was really like, no, I mean, you're working together. You work with people yeah. who are talented people and that was how you did things. Exactly. So you, you were, uh, listen, every, I just, it's a comment. Everybody wanted to be a rock star. I mean, the Beatles were happening. All these different mm -hmm. things were going on. I wanted to be a rock star too. Um, <laughs> Mark, uh, you can see what happened to me. It didn't quite happen. Well, and the problem is my, my instrument was not the guitar, which was actually kind of a hip rock thing to play. I played the violin. 
And, uh, you know, there were a couple violinists who were in the rock, but most people, yeah. and I played, I played more classical and violin, and that wasn't quite the genre of music that was really taking the world at that point in time. So <laughs> I, I quickly abandoned my, uh, my dreams of becoming a rock star. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny that I guess that, that was a common thread, wasn't it, in, in that yes. that period of time? So I you came so. to California, you went to work, you were, and then you son, somehow you begin to find your way into a different uh, into a different world. Tell us a little bit about that transformation. Yeah, well, I started working in Hollywood and doing uh, you know, a lot of writing for you know behind the scenes for uh, these producers and directors, and I. I became the writer's assistant to one writer director in particular named Cyrus Narasta uh who was an Iranian American filmmaker here he's had a lengthy career in Hollywood writing for television and movies and then ultimately kind of directing his own films and he's still doing it um and he and I connected and connected on a lot of ways and so basically, I just became his assistant, and it led to everything from doing a little bit of ghost writing for him in terms of screenwriting. Um, it led me to writing my own screenplays. But the, so, so I was gradually now becoming a, write, a writer. But the biggest transformation was Cyrus Narasta is a political conservative. Hmm. Now, I mean, he describes himself as more libertarian, but he's you know essentially conservative, and this was unusual in Hollywood. Um, and I myself was not conservative. I was what we would think of today as liberal. In other words, not, I was definitely not far left. Like if, you know, Dennis Prager makes this distinction between liberal now and leftist. Uh, liberal is kind of the old fashioned classical liberal. Uh, and then there, the more extreme end of that is the or the leftists, and I was definitely not a leftist. Yeah, you were I was not probably more like a what, what we oftentimes talk about as a John Kennedy Democrat. I mean, John yeah, John, I, John Kennedy today would probably be on, on the spectrum of things. That's right. Would be uh, probably more on the on center. He certainly would not be on the hard left. That's for darn sure. Just based on my understanding of his uh, his thinking and his uh, policies, actually, but. You're right. I I understand. So you were more of a classic liberal, uh, and that was how I guess Hollywood has f famously been uh, that. But now they're becoming a little bit more on the left, uh, the left hand side of the of the uh, aisle. There, further and further left. But anyway, yeah. forgive me for interrupting. Go ahead. Oh, no worries at all. Um, uh, it, but I was not political. I mean, even as a liberal, I was not political. My interests lay solely in the arts. I did not care about politics. I found it boring. I only cared about art and literature and music and all of these humanities-oriented uh, fields. Uh, but, you know, as they say, you may not care about politics, but politics cares about you. And so eventually, a political impact happened, which is that he and I began, Cyrus and I began working on this project together, a mini series for ABC called The Path to 9 11, uh, which was about the eight years between the first World Trade Center bombing, which a lot of people don't even know ever happened anymore. In 1993, the World Trade Center was bombed by Islamic extremists. Right. The parking lot. Uh, they, they blew up the parking lot. Yeah. I remember that's it. That's right. I remember it very so, well. Yeah. So, uh, so ABC was very excited about this miniseries. It was going to be, they, they were going to pump a lot of money into it. And in fact, it was the most expensive miniseries at the time. It was over $30 million. Um, and it was going to cover that period from the 93 World Trade Center bombing all the way up to the events of 9-11-2001 and show how we got to 9-11 and how, uh, you know, our weakness about this uh burgeoning Islamic fundamentalist movement uh, ultimately came down hard on us in the 9-11 attacks. Um, even before that miniseries aired, word got out about this project and a lot of Clinton administration alumni, people you know uh, who used to belong to the Bill Clinton administration, which was in that time frame that we were writing about from 93 to 2000, at least, you know, not quite up to 9-11, 2001, but up to almost 
to that point. Clinton was president during that time. Yeah. So the, these Clinton administration alumni were very concerned that the miniseries would make Clinton look bad, make, that would make him look weak on terror, and that it would tarnish his legacy or his reputation. And then once they found out that Cyrus Narasta was a conservative, that gave them all the ammunition they needed to create this internet campaign against the miniseries being aired at all. And I'm telling you, it was it was front page news for a little while um, because even before the miniseries aired, the media began talking about it. Uh, even Bill Clinton came out and and uh, and got angry about it in a, a kind of an infamous interview with Chris Wallace at the time. The the campaign against my friend Cyrus and the other filmmakers, uh, for example, the director of it, who was not really a political guy, but he too, but he was very Christian and a kind of a Christian activist. So I think you can see that the far left latched onto this as uh, a, a kind of a right wing conspiracy to smear Clinton through this miniseries project. Hmm. Okay. So the, the the controversy about it became so intense that um, uh, Harry, uh, that the Senator Harry Reid, almost forgot his name for a moment, Senator Harry Reid threatened ABC saying that if you air this miniseries, we are going to pull your license. You won't you won't be able to function as a network. So all of this all of this began to open my eyes about politics and also about the party that I thought I belonged to. Yeah, I was because my friends and in, in this were part of this project were getting death threats. You know, they were getting phone calls from the left threatening them, and the internet was just on fire with attacking these people. And I began to realize that the party that I thought I belonged to had left me behind, much like Reagan said, you know, I didn't leave the Democrats, the Democrats left me. Yeah. Well, that's that's what I began to realize. And also, at the same time, through my friend, I was starting to meet some other conservatives in Hollywood. And lo and behold, they were not the knuckle-dragging uh, racists that I'd been told that they were in the, you know, in the cultural setting in my little bubble, my left-leaning bubble that I'd lived my entire adult life in, lo and behold, these people were intelligent, good human beings. They were moral. They had their lives together. Um, they were interesting and funny. I mean, they, they became real to me. Conservatives became real to me for the first time in my life. Um, and so I, I had this kind of cultural awakening. A political awakening, I should say, and gradually began to turn conservative, and and that it, it reached the point where uh, I began to meet people like Andrew Breitbart, um, who was a very uh, the late Andrew Breitbart. He died ten years or so ago, uh, way ahead of his time. But Breitbart was very influential in conservative circles in terms of getting conservatives to understand the impact of the culture. Uh, he's famous for saying, although I don't think that phrase originated with him, but he's famous for saying politics flows downstream from culture. Yeah, no, I, know. Um, I, I think he did say that, but I, I, I hear that attribution a lot of times. But anyway. Yeah. And Breitbart kind of latched on to me because he saw me as similar to him and that he, too, had come from the left and become a conservative. And um, so he asked if I wanted to write for these websites that he was starting up at the time. Uh, now it's just called Breitbart.com, but in the, at the time he had created a series of websites called Big Hollywood, which was about, you know, a conservative perspective on showbiz, uh, Big Government, which is about conservative perspective on politics, Big Journalism. So he started a whole series of sites, and I began writing for Big Hollywood. Uh, and all of a sudden, I was a political commentator. You know, a guy I I. Uh, had never cared about politics. I had always been a liberal, and all of a sudden, I was a conservative culture critic. Uh, and but it really gave it gave me an opportunity to become the writer that I had always wanted to be and avoided for so much of my life. So, so was this a a self declaration that you were now a conservative, or was it the the people who were opposing you suddenly came against you and branded you? In this category, because I, you know, I don't know if you'd want to. I mean, most conservatives at that time would probably say, you know, to to wear that title is something that maybe not necessarily you want to do. 
but was that the the title that that was the description that they made about you? Is that how it went? Yes, initially I was a little reluctant to just flat out label myself a conservative. I wasn't sure where I was on the spectrum of conservative belief. I didn't know much about libertarianism or any of that. You know, I didn't quite you, understand. You were, those you were a non-political guy, like like most people, and a lot probably yeah. like a lot of people listening to this conversation right now. Yeah, and uh, yeah, but it, so it's kind of a slow awakening for me. But I quickly discovered, you know, that friends that I had had on the left dropped me like a hot potato, as they used to say back in the day, um, and uh, that was kind of eye-opening to me, too, because I realized these were people for whom politics was everything. Uh, you know, and the, uh, one of the distinctions between conservative, kind of a broad distinction, but one of the distinctions between conservative and liberal, I think, is that conservatives don't really want to care much about politics. We want to just get on with our lives and the business of living and raising families and starting businesses and things like that. We only want to care about politics when we need to. But on the left, especially the farther left you go, politics is their religion. Yeah. And uh, and it's it's something they live and breathe every day. <laughs> you think about that old 1960s phrase, you know, the, the political, the personal is the political. And that's really kind of the uh, uh, the motto, I think, of a lot of, of the left today is that everything and you can see it in the culture. Every single thing has been politicized. You cannot escape it now. Yeah. Which is a tragedy, I think. Um, but yeah, in I mean, anyway, every, the, I remember the quote from uh, the Clintons, uh, both Hillary and Bill. They said everything is political. Uh, that was kind of what they how they said things. Okay, listen, we're get, Mark. I'm gonna we're gonna get back to this conversation. I'm gonna take sure. a one minute break at this point in time. We're gonna uh, come back and I, I want to talk a little bit more uh, directly about some of the things your projects you're doing. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the book you're writing. And uh, so we'll go on from there. But friends, uh, you're listening today to the Hamilton Review. We're gonna, we are talking today to Mark Tapson. He is the Shulman Fellow on Popular Culture, works with the David Horowitz Freedom Center, and we will be right back. The Hamilton Review podcast is brought to you by Hamilton Babies, nine kid-friendly products designed for the little loves in your life. Find them at hamiltonbabies.com or amazon.com. Also consider Dr. Hamilton's recently published book, Seven Secrets of the Newborn, available at Barnes & Noble, your local independent bookstore, and Amazon.com. So friends, welcome back to the Hamilton Review. We're continuing our conversation with Mark Tapson. Mark, uh, Mark is a, a writer. He, he writes about culture and politics and the, the intersection, intersection of those two things. Mark... Um, one of the questions I asked you this in our in our pre call uh, conversation about the culture and and of course my the, the subtitle of my show is where kids and culture collide so I think you're the mm -hmm. right guy to have on the show but um, you know I one of the things I you know always am looking at and I I have to say that I I spend a lot of my time looking at the horizon uh, thinking about what things are popping up that I'm seeing on the horizon <clears throat> culturally that are worrying, worrying me. And I have, a, I have a handful of them, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to kind of pick your mind and I'm going to ask you a question. What are, what are the threats in popular culture that you see right now that are a threat to the health and well-being of kids? Uh, and uh, take it from there, Mark. Wow. Well, Dr. Bob, it, it would actually be quicker and easier to talk about the things in our culture today that are not a danger to our children because <laughs> those are so few and far between. But there's such a wide range of things. It, it pains me to say that I think our civilization is in kind of a state of decline. Um, we're in a decadent age, and the world is not like the one that I grew up in and that I think you grew up in, too. I grew up watching TV shows like The Andy Griffith Show, uh, The Lone Ranger, you know, shows that were full of innocence that the entire family could enjoy and that promoted values and virtues. Um, maybe a little heavy handedly sometimes, but uh, still, it was it was a time. Not a perfect time by any means, but there was so much cultural innocence compared to today. And I think that's a, it's a tragedy that we've lost that. We've thrown that away. We could never in our wildest dreams, Dr. Bob, have imagined how far the culture would push the envelope of what can be seen and heard and said in entertainment today. Um, so that's one thing is that kind of the, the degradation 
of our culture, and I would say the sexualization of our culture. Uh, and then there are the obvious things that everybody knows that are threats to children, like the hypnotic allure of high-tech devices like cell phones and tablets and other kinds of screens that simply suck children into them and don't give them back. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's that's a real danger. And I see that in, not in my own kids, because we're my kids are just great in terms of uh, of their any kind of obsession with high tech devices. They're not immune to it. But we're my wife and I are pretty um, careful about how much screen time we let them have and that sort of thing. We give them a lot of other kinds of experiences um, outside screens. Um, one of the things I could say about our culture is that American culture now is pop culture. That's what it is. It's not the high culture, as we used to call it, of times past, uh, you know, where where everyone was kind of immersed in the same sort of cultural uh, literacy, where uh, people knew a little bit about Shakespeare or they knew about classical music or they knew about uh, art, for example. We're now in a culture and have been for many decades um, that is so rooted in the now and in the new and in the what's next uh, that younger generations just have little or no connection at all now to anything that happened before they were born or maybe even before just a couple of years ago. Um, even less do they have a connection with the grand civilizational heritage that I was talking about a moment ago that stretches all the way back to classical times and beyond. Yeah, Younger, younger generations now just do not have a cultural legacy, uh, legacy, sorry, cultural literacy that extends beyond, say, The Simpsons TV show. Yeah, you know, you know can I inter interrupt here for a second? My, my, wife was, uh, my wife was sharing with me um, just a, a, a day or so ago that uh, the, the recently we had what, we, what is called the Holocaust Remembrance Day. I think it was uh, a short time mm -hmm. ago. And uh, they had the man on the street, I think in New York City, uh, kind of walking around saying, you know what the Holocaust was? And and it was like shocking how many people uh, had no idea. We you know who were the Nazis. Mm -hmm. who, you know, told us about World War II. It was the I think that in addition to cultural issues that you're talking about, Jeremy, I mean, obviously high culture like Shakespeare and and you know art and and what's you know what's hanging in the Louvre in Paris. Uh, mm -hmm. I would consider that relatively. You know, those were things that we knew about. Certainly, as I heard about as a kid growing up. Uh, those things are are far far away from the common pop pop culture today. But even historical major historical mm -hmm. events, um, <clears throat> like the Holocaust, which I, I regard that as one of the, the major uh, a real major event in in the twentieth century, mm -hmm. are, are unknown to people. And this is this is concerning to me. Anyway, so you're co you're completely correct that there is a there is this lack of awareness on behalf of uh, not only young people, but I think even even adults uh, to these to these issues. Exactly. And I homeschool, uh, my wife and I homeschool our kids, and also I teach teenagers in our homeschooling community. Um, and homeschooled kids, generally speaking, tend to be more educated and uh, uh, better socialized and a little better acculturated in terms of the civilizational legacy that we're talking about. But even those kids, even those teens that I teach are, to me anyway, kind of shockingly ignorant of a lot of stuff that was in my day considered common knowledge. Yeah. Um, and it, it, that's one of the things that drives me as a teacher, which I'm pleased to say and blessed to say that I uh, have become now, um, one of the things that drives me is trying to open the eyes of younger generations to the glories of our civilization and how we got here um, to this point, because they're not going to hear that anywhere else. <laughs> they're not going to get it in the culture. Um, and precious few of these younger generations, these teenagers are going to get it from school even, yeah. um, especially today. I mean, I'm, I'm very negative about um, uh, the situation in our current educational system system right now. Um, I'm very high on homeschooling. Yeah, tell um, us about tell us about that because this is a. I don't have too many homeschooling parents who come on the show. Uh, I I mean, most people I think look at homeschooling as being a gigantic, uh, overwhelming task. Is it possible to do uh, elegantly and good and good and 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 uh, providing good education? 
uh, without completely devoting every living minute of your life to doing it? Well, it, uh, it is a little bit of a struggle. It's It can be over. Let me put it this way. In the beginning, it's overwhelming. Um, we didn't really know what we were getting into when we started with homeschooling. I just knew that I was bound and determined to keep my kids, to keep the culture away, you know, from um, kidnapping my kids. Yeah. My wife was more reluctant in the beginning, um, but she quickly overcame that and, in fact, dived more deeply into learning about homeschooling than I did. She's She knows much more now about the whole uh, administrative side of, of homeschooling. And I'm really just kind of the teacher. Um, and I'm happy that it's that way. She, I'm happy that she takes care of all that stuff, but it, it can be, it can be as much of a full-time job as you want it to be. And so I know it's, it's very difficult for most parents to try to homeschool. Um, I'm, we're kind of, my wife and I are kind of blessed to be in this position where we can do it because I work from home. Uh, because I'm a teacher at heart, and so I'm really into it. Uh, and my wife, and I'm the sole breadwinner, so my wife is home um, and able to devote a lot of her time, not just to um, raising children, but also to being involved in their homeschooling. So yeah. I know I know we're in an unusual situation. We're blessed about that, and I don't blame any parent who simply cannot do that. But I do tell every every time I'm invited to speak somewhere, I tell people. If it's at all possible, if you can do it, homeschool your kids and get them out of our disastrous educational system. And, you know, if you're a grandparent, and a lot of the groups that I speak to include older people, unfortunately, I wish I could speak more to younger people, but if you're a grandparent and have some extra time on your hands, try to arrange it so that you can homeschool your grandchildren. Maybe, you, maybe their parents don't have the time, but maybe their grandparents do. Um, and if you, if they can do that, then by all means do it because the culture is is intentionally designed these days to drive a wedge between children and their parents and grandparents. It's that is the the leftist agenda, and I, I hate to make it sound like you know right wing conspiracy theory sort of a thing, but it's out there now. It's it's open, and it has you know this this whole uh, I, you can trace this impulse in leftist politics all the way back to Karl Marx, who literally called for the abolition of the family. Um, so he was pretty open about it. And, and the, the, the Marxism that we're experiencing today is something called cultural Marxism. Uh, it's kind of indistinguishable from what people often call wokeness. Um, speaking of which, I'm often asked to explain what wokeness is because a lot of conservatives hear this term, but they don't quite understand what it is. There's not there there you can make the definition as complicated as you want, but the basic definition of wokeness is it is a a state of enlightenment about social justice issues. That's the basic definition of it. But to expand on it a little bit, it involves a particular perspective about those social justice issues. And that is a Marxist perspective in which the world is reduced to um, power plays and uh, competition for power, uh, where you have one, you know one group trying to oppress another, um, and Marx was all about you know supporting the oppressed groups to overthrow the oppressor group and all that sort of thing, and, and that's what cultural Marxism is about is is a uh, a, a a whole demographic collection of oppressed groups like minorities and women and um, L the LGBTQ community. Those are the oppressed groups who need to overthrow the oppressor, which is the white male patriarchal power structure. So that's it's a very Marxist way of looking at the world that is kind of a rejection of the way reality really works. <laughs> but that's the Marxist perspective. And that's the woke perspective is that Everything is about social justice. Everything is political. Um, so that's that. And being woke means being enlightened about that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that and there's this idea of the zero sum, <clears throat> which means that if you're mm -hmm. up, I'm, you know, the other person is down and you can mm -hmm. there isn't a there isn't this idea that we can all, all you know, um, 
prosperity lifts all boats. No, it's either one yes. boat's up, one boat's down. And that, yeah. and the idea that you got to not allow anyone to uh, have, you know, this idea of, of, of equity uh, is sometimes. Uh, we, I believe, I think we all believe in equality of opportunity, equality mm-hmm. of of uh, education as much as possible. I don't think there's any issue with the idea of equity. Is really that you're equal to me, I'm e- I'm equal to you, <clears throat> which is very much a, a Marxist uh, ideology, right? Yes, and, and, yet- and my observation is that you know people are quite different. Uh, there are people who have different <laughs> gifts thing, giftings. Uh, you know, there are people who are phenomenal uh, violin players. I can see it. I, I can see their gifting. And I, I like to play the violin, but I, I also know that there are people who are better at it than I am. So I don't, I don't <laughs> look at that in trying to make everyone equal when it comes to violin playing uh, or anything else, really. So I, I think the world is much more complicated than that, that reductionist uh, kind of perspective. So, yes. so wokeism is one threat. Um, the mm-hmm. idea of this assault on the family. You mentioned to me this idea of loss of innocence. Can you expound on that? Uh, yes, I could unfortunately expound upon it for a long time, because, but I'll, I'll just narrow it down to uh, the biggest threat I see in terms of our loss of innocence, culturally speaking, and for children. The biggest threat to that today is gender ideology, which is part of wokeness is part of the cultural Marxist assault on our civilization. Uh, gender ideology is, uh, it, it, it basically um, tries, the, let me back up. <laughs> the whole impulse behind gender ideology is to instill, first of all, it's to instill in children as young as kindergartners, a sexual consciousness. It's to make them aware of their own sexuality, or at least to to inculcate in them a sense of their own sexuality at a much, much earlier age than we ever had to do in the past, or or that kids are even capable of grasping and and, uh, dealing with. It's to inculcate, inculcate a sexual consciousness in them, and then a sexual confusion as well, a confusion about being male or female, a confusion about what those terms mean, and because the ultimate goal of gender ideology is to eradicate those distinctions between male and female. It's to create a sort of a, so much gender confusion um, that, that, that the whole binary of male and female goes away. Because yeah. that is part, it's, it's part of the eradication and abolition of the family. Once you eradicate these distinctions between male and female, then all of a sudden the word mother doesn't mean anything really, or father, or brother, or sister. Those, those things have no real meaning or definition if, they're, if these distinctions are all culturally um, constructed, which is what the leftists would say, that you know, being masculine is just a cultural construction. Uh, so gender ideology is, is is a it's a very seductive but insidious indoctrination, and it's a real threat to our children's actual innocence and our cultural innocence as well. Uh, it's a sexualization of the culture. Um, it's a, a very narcissistic kind of uh, religion of the self in a way. Um, so as you can see, it's, it's a complicated topic that I could probably ramble on about at length, but that's, that's the problem with one of the problems with gender ideology is this destruction of our children's literal innocence and our cultural innocence as a civilization. Yeah. You know, I think that's so true. I, I think about my childhood and, and maybe my childhood and your, your child were, um, similar in many ways. Uh, I got up in the morning when I was when I was in kindergarten, and I and I went to school, and I and I came back. It was a half day. I came back and uh, kind of played in the yard and ran around. Didn't really have a whole <laughs> heck of a lot to do, and I wasn't thinking about these issues. I certainly wasn't thinking about pronouns. That's for darn sure. Um, and I and because it was it was common sense. It wasn't like I had to think about that. I, I knew who I was. I think every I, I look back on, on my childhood, and I and I do think, and I, I'm just trying to be honest with myself. Were there any any young kids in my school or anyone I ever heard of in my entire life who had issues with gender identification? And the answer is, and I'm being honest, there was zero. There were mm-hmm. no, no none. I had I had no people in in my in my life, and maybe I just was hidden uh, from us. Of course, we sometimes we don't know that. Of course. 
but um, I, I kind of do know that because I'm a doctor and I know that the, the frequency of these things is exceedingly, exceedingly rare uh, mm-hmm. until the last couple of years, really. But anyway, that is something that we didn't think about, did we, Mark? And, that, and this idea of sexualization, and I think you're correct. I think that, you know, um, these issues of, of sex, I, I, I was wonderfully naive until I was much older. Yes. And, I, and it was like, I just, I was a boy and I played with, the, I played with everyone. I, played, I had sisters, I played with them, I played with my friends who were boys in the neighborhood, the girls in the neighborhood. Uh, I had a great time. We ran around, we, we played hide and go seek. We had, I had a, looking back, I, I really do appreciate my, the innocence of my childhood. It's yes. very, very different today than uh, when we were kids, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. So I do think that the loss of innocence, um, I think that, um, you know, you're, I, I want to get into this thing that you're, you're writing a book. Uh, I'm going to turn the, I'm going to turn the, uh, the conversation to, um, your book you're writing actually. Yes. We'll talk about your book. Then I want you to talk about some recommendations for our listeners, but real quickly, Mark, sure. tell us a little bit about the book It's on chivalry and boys directed to boys. Uh, tell us uh, why did you want to write this book in the essence of what you're writing? Uh, well, as a culture critic, one of the things that I um, focused on and began writing about as uh, long as 10 or 12 years ago was what I suppose you could call the war on masculinity. You hear that phrase occasionally, the war on masculinity. and It sounds kind of overblown, um, but I think there is a, an actual assault, a coordinated concerted effort or assault on masculinity in our culture. Um, And the reason for that ties into what we were talking about before about the abolition of the family. I think the aim of the war on masculinity, you know, boys and men now are labeled as toxic. Their their nature is considered poisonous. Uh, This term toxic masculinity became kind of a household phrase overnight within the last few years. Um, And it's very damaging to boys and young men and their sense of what it means to be a man and what their true nature is and what they are intended to be as they grow up. Uh, So I began to see this as a, and I wasn't alone, uh, but I saw this as a serious threat to our culture at large. And also on a personal level, I have a, a lot of children, or at least more than the norm. I have five kids, four of whom are girls. Uh, the boy is is pretty much brand new, so I was mostly writing about this at a time when uh, I had all girls. But still, this topic of masculinity was became very vital for me because I want my girls to grow up in a world in which men are good and chivalrous. I want them to grow up and uh, have, you know, uh, good husbands. Uh, I want uh, people to have good fathers and brothers. And, you know, I want men to be good. And I think if you want a better world, it starts with making better men. Uh, And so I saw this, this attack on masculinity as being extremely detrimental to our culture. It's part of the abolition of the family, because, you know, if you, if you break down masculinity and uh, undermine that authority and energy, that masculine authority and energy, then the family begins to disintegrate and the state has has no opposition anymore. The state becomes the patriarch. The state becomes the father figure and our authority figure. That's so true. Uh, so, I, could, but do, me, do us a favor. Would you kindly de- define chivalry? Uh, well, <laughs> that's almost as difficult to do as defining wokeness. But chivalry essentially, and there's a lot of confusion about this, especially among younger people uh, for whom chivalry is a dirty word for both boys and girls, men, young men and young women. Chivalry is a warrior code. It is essentially a warrior code of virtue and valor. Now, chivalry went through several different historical phases, which I talk about in the book, one of which is basically, I call Christian chivalry. It's the melding of this warrior nature with Christian values. And that's what really created the kind of chivalry that we, that people kind of automatically think of, which is, uh, you know, a good man coming to the rescue of the defenseless, um, someone who stands up against evil. Uh, um, that's, that's, that comes from this, um, this melding of Christianity and chivalry. But at, at its heart, it is kind of a warrior code. So there's an element of courage, um, of valor, uh, of defending the defenseless, of masculine strength 
that is there. And I think a lot of young people don't get that anymore about chivalry. They think, you know, uh, except that maybe young women think that, well, chivalry is patriarchal and it's oppressive. It's a gender power play if someone even opens the door for me. Um, and young men look at chivalry and think, well, chivalry is part of the problem of feminism. Chivalry helped create feminism because it's, you know, we're supposed to be deferential to women and we're supposed to uh, kneel before women and and kind of put them on a pedestal. That is an element of chivalry that kind of went off the rails in the late Middle Ages, and I won't get into that now, but it's that's not all there is to chivalry by any means. It's not even at the core of chivalry. So chivalry, my goal... chivalry is not only a, a, a phenomenon between a man and a woman. It can also be between a man, uh, a, a chivalrous man, and say a bully who's who's picking on a kid uh, who's younger or smaller, or even an animal, or uh, any other kind of a uh, situation which were clearly there's uh, oppression going on. Uh, we oftentimes think of chivalry only in the context of relationships between men and women. Is that is that part of the problem? Oh, yes. And 10 times out of 10, if you ask someone to what they think of when they think of the word chivalry, they'll say, well, opening a door for a woman <laughs> or pulling her chair out for her, you know, at the dinner table. Uh, and there's so much more, is such a bigger dimension to that. But essentially, it's about masculine uh, virtue. It's about um, not just, as you put it, relationships between men and women, but your, your, the relationship between men and their community and men and their civilization at large. And it's, it, it's, uh, it's a code of values that include really basic virtues like honesty, uh, courage, um, uh, uh, self-respect, self-reliance, self-determination. Uh, and these are values that I think are considered old fashioned and archaic now. We've, you know, we're in a culture that worships the self instead of service to others. And that's another important feature of chivalry is service to others. So I'm trying to reclaim this word chivalry as a cultural ideal. Yeah. And that's really the, the purpose of the book is to put that out there for men, a lot of whom are looking for masculinity gurus. And you, you have people like Jordan Peterson who are really good gu masculinity gurus. And then you have people like, uh, uh, you have people who are not such good masculinity <laughs> gurus. Yeah. I suppose. You don't have to uh, mention names. I, I know who yeah, they are. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I, but no one, and I will say not even Jordan Peterson, no one talks about chivalry. Yeah. And I, I think that chivalry is that is this forgotten masculine code that that men need and young boys need to be educated about. And in fact, toward that end, I, I want to do more than just the book. I hope to start a nonprofit, an educational nonprofit to promote these values of chivalry and also to create a podcast and videos and uh, other things that will turn this into a movement, Hopefully, a movement. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. A movement. So Mark, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's it. I'm I'm watching our time here. Can I say one thing? Do it. Okay, get on with it. Do it. Get it done. <laughs> yes. Because I want. I when you and when you get it done, I'm going to have you back on my show. I'm Great, watching our time where time is is elapsing here. I want you to make a couple of recommendations before we turn we uh, say goodbye to you. Uh, what? The people who are listening to the show, what what do we do? I mean, do we just wring our hands? Yeah. Uh, give us some give us some recommendations. I'll try to be real quick about it. I think there are three things people can do. There's political, cultural, and spiritual responses to this cultural crisis. The political is pretty easy. Get out and vote, but also vote for politicians who understand that it's all about the culture war. It's not enough now to just vote for a politician who promotes free market values or supports the Second Amendment. You've got, it's got to be someone like a Ron DeSantis who understands the culture war. So look for people like that. On a cultural level, do everything you can to resist the culture for yourself and also for your children. Uh, push back. Be very, very alert about what your children are watching and hearing and seeing uh, because they are being seduced away from you. And on a spiritual level, we've got to recognize that ultimately this is a spiritual conflict, a spiritual battle that we're involved with. Um, between good and evil. And I hate to make it sound so grandiose, but that's really what it's about. Yeah. And so pray, uh, strengthen yourself spiritually uh, in whatever way you possibly can and strengthen yourself spiritually in your spiritual community. Uh, and so I think those are ways that you can 
push back against the cultural assault we're facing. Very good. Okay. Well, listen, friends, um, <clears throat> Mark, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you, for being, be, thank you for being on the Hamilton Review. And friends, you have been listening today to Mark Tapson. He's a talented guy, got a lot going on. He's the Shulman Fellow of Popular Culture. You can see that. He, it comes out pretty clearly talking to him at the David Horowitz <laughs> Freedom Center. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us, uh, friends. And until next time, be well. Bye-bye. You have been listening to The Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day. Tune in again next week on Apple Podcasts. Rate and comment and tell a friend.